So this is the topic, fundamentals of Raman spectroscopy. As I told, this lecture has uh, uh, got background of the molecular spectroscopy and particularly the infrared and micro spectroscopy. These are the topic which I have already explained in my previous lecture. So we know the symmetric stretching vibrations are not responsible in generating the varying dipole, electrical dipole moment in the molecule. But asymmetric stretching vibrations bending vibrations with respect to time are responsible for generating the variation in direction of electric dipole moment. And this variation in electric dipole moment, which is equivalent to a kind of signal, electric signal, if the frequency of the signal is equal to the frequency of the illuminating radiation, then resonance will occur and that molecule absorb that frequency and in the spectrum, we will see the dip, we will see, we can see the dip or we can see the peak. So this is the uh, basis of observation of a molecular spectroscope. So particularly vibrations, they may be bending vibration, they may be asymmetric vibration, maybe symmetric vibration or the rotations are responsible for the micro and IR spectroscopy and we have seen the corresponding spectra, the selection rules, etc, etc. In addition to this microwave and IR spectroscopy, there, was, there is one more spectroscopy called as electronic spectroscopy. So, if, if, you, if you see this diagram, energy band diagram, where energy is plotted against inter-nuclear separation, you will see that it is a kind of a Morse curve. So, and this is the dissociation energy of the molecule. This molecule gets dissociated into atoms when we apply this much energy to the molecule. But if the energy is less than the dissociation energy, here for example, then it is say, said that it is the equilibrium state of the molecule. But if you try to decrease the distance between the two atoms or two nuclei towards this side, for example, this side. towards this side for example, then what will happen? Force of repulsion will increase and once again your atoms or your force will pull you here. And if you try to increase the inter-nuclear distance this way, again force of attraction will increase and you are uh, try to, you are pulled here and the distance is always, this is the equilibrium distance between the two atoms. So this is the ground state electronic configuration or this is the ground state electronic energy level and if the interatomic distance, if it is displaced, it is different, then it is called as a virtual electronic state or it is called as excited state. So there can be a transition from ground state electronic energy level and excited state electronic energy level. If the order of this transition is one electron volt, then the order of the vibrational transition is few milli electron volt and order of rotational transition is of the order of few micro electronic, micro electron volt. So you can, you can see the rotational energy level have energy of a few micro electron volt, vibrational level, few milli electron volt. So we will be talking of a milli and micro electron volt energy, so small energy, right? Now we know if we take a matter and if you illuminate this matter with the incident electromagnetic radiation, monochromatic uh, electromagnetic radiation, Having wavelength lambda and its intensity or amplitude is I0, then various phenomena occur. One of the phenomena is this incident light may get reflected, this incident light may get absorbed in the matter or this incident light 
may get transmitted through the light uh, through the matter if it is transmitted then its wavelength or energy or wave number whatever it may be it is unchanged but what is changed the transmitted intensity or the amplitude of the electromagnetic radiation it gets modulated modified that is the only change which takes place during the transmission but in addition to reflection absorption and transmission there is one more phenomena so far as incident uh, monochromatic light when incident on matter is concerned and that is called as a scattering so scattered light is different than the transmitted light it is scatters in all possible direction keep in mind transmitted light doesn't go in this direction or in that direction it goes in the direction of incoming light but scattered light goes in the all possible directions and if light is scattered then there are two possibilities that its wavelength remains same its intensity or you can say amplitude it modifies and another possibility is that its intensity gets modified as well as its wavelength gets modified the first alternate is called as rayleigh scatter and another is called as raman scatter this rayleigh scattering the best example of a rayleigh scattering is blueness of our sky we know intensity of the rayleigh scattered light is given by the rayleigh formula is which is proportional to 1 upon lambda raised to 4 and we know in case of a blue light wavelength is wavelength is less than red orange yellow or green light and if wavelength is less this factor will be more and therefore the amplitude or the intensity of the scattered blue light is more than orange red yellow that is the reason why we see the sky to be blue right so this is the example of a rayleigh scatter but this raman scattering is a optical analog of this compton scattering we have learned in case of x-ray diffraction for example when x-rays having wavelength lambda i they collide with the electron at a rest then then we know this electron gets recoiled in the direction of incident photon and this photon also gets scattered through angle theta plus phi and we know the wavelengths of incident and scattered photon x ray photon i am talking they are different and they are related by this relation and this is the famous phenomenon of compton scattering my intention is not to explain you compton scattering just to remind yourself that this raman effect is a optical analog of x ray compton effect so in raman effect wavelength and intensity gets modified of a monochromatic light so generally this raman spectroscopy is a light scattering phenomena and this was invented by our indian scientist bharat ratna sir cv raman and this is the instrument of the raman you you know for getting nobel prize high fine instruments are not needed you need innovative ideas and raman was successful was successful in putting forth the innovative idea of the scattering and therefore he got the nobel prize and we are very proud of him so when monochromatic light say green light it falls on the molecule and this molecule is either in vibration or rotation or any other state which is a non rest motion then it is possible that this incoming green light gets scattered as a rally light or we get stokes and anti stokes line or the wavelength of this incoming light increases or decreases now if the wavelength of emitted light or the energy of emitted light is less than the incident light then it is called as stokes scattering and if the energy of emitted light if it is greater than the incident light then it is called as anti stokes raman scattering 
Now, if you take a spectrum by illuminating your material by green light, then you get blue light and red light. For example, in case of an anatized TiO2, I am going to take the example of anatized TiO2 later on. We see that we get anti Stokes line and Stokes line. So, this Raman spectroscopy is a very beautiful and very informative technique and it is a very uh, chemical analysis technique which we can use for the study in research in metal science. So, we get a peak in the Raman spectrum, in the Raman spectrum. So, intensity on the y axis and on the x axis you have either wave number or energy or wavelength or the Raman shift. I am going to explain you the interrelation between all these soon. But what information we get from the Raman study? We get lot of information. We get qualitative, quantitative as well as other properties of the material. So from the peak positions, for example, you get molecular frequencies, which are the chemical content and what, are, what is the phase content. So you, you do qualitative analysis and from the intensity and the peak position combination, you, you can do the quantitative analysis that how much percentage of one matter is there, how much percentage of other matter is there. If the same material is in the form of uh, amorphous or in the crystalline, you can find out the ratio of amorphous to crystalline, you can find out the film thickness, etc. If there is a peak shifting from the theoretical peak positions, then we know as very similar to X-ray diffraction, there is a stress and you can find out mechanical stress in the molecular system and in the crystalline system as well. You, from the FWHM, as you know, in case of X-ray, we find the crystallite size. So, from FWHM, here we find the crystal quality. Crystallinity is more, then the peak width is less. If crystallinity is less, then peak width is more. For example, nanocrystalline material, the peak width is more. Raman peaks also are broad. You can find out defects, impurities. And from the perpendicular and parallel polarization, if you allow to incident polarized light and if you analyze uh, the uh, scattered light with the help of polarizer, then it is possible to find out symmetry and orientation of the molecular system or crystalline system. That is, it is possible to study polarization also with the help of Raman. So many things we can study with the help of Raman effect or Raman spectroscopy. Here I have shown few um, vibrations of a triatomic molecules. Because for diatomic molecules, either we have rotation or we have stretching and that may be symmetric or anti-symmetric and that we have learned in the previous lecture on the molecular spectroscopy. So here I have tried to show you a uh, few six examples I have shown. These are representative examples. These are not all possible uh, vibrations. This is the example of a symmetric stretching. This is example of anti-symmetric stretching. This is scissoring, bending. This is twisting. If you are able to clearly see, this is example of a twisting. And this is wagging. You go ahead and come back. Go ahead and come back. This is rocking dance. You, you, you might be knowing rocking dance. So out of these possible vibrations. The vibrations which cause change in polarizability are responsible for giving the spectrum Raman spectrum. Otherwise, you get a spectrum, IR spectrum and Raman spectrum in all cases. So, if your molecule has a symmetry, then those vibrations are Raman active. For example, symmetric stretching, scissoring, twisting, these are symmetric vibrations and these are Raman active means we get peaks in the Raman spectra due to these vibrations. But keep in mind, these vibrations are responsible for changing the polarizability of the molecule. So what is polarizability? What is polarizability ellipsoid? I am going to tell you in a minute. So far as molecules are concerned, we have studied in previous lecture simple diatomic molecules. But we know in polyatomic molecule, that is triatomic, tetraatomic, etc., etc., 
for all these molecules the raman spectra and this selection rules they are different i am going to give you example but here i would like to tell you the difference between homopolar and heteropolar molecules homo means same n2o2 h2cl2 br2 i2 are the examples of homopolar diatomic molecules and in these homopolar diatomic molecules vibrations are along the chemical bond as i have showed here vibrations are along the chemical bond and these molecules are only raman active keep in mind i have given this example of homopolar molecule in my molecular spectroscopy lecture there these were not active there keep in mind but they are active raman active but on the other hand heteropolar diatomic molecule like co no are both raman and infrared active so we get peak in infrared region and we get peak in the raman spectrum as well and i have given here the vibrational frequency of the molecules in wave number units wave number units here you can see and they are different and these are characteristics of those molecules keep in mind and that leads to the beauty of adds to the beauty of raman or ir technology let us touch upon the quantum theory of the raman effect we know in case of a raman uh, scattering uh, we have elastic collisions and inelastic collisions we know in case of elastic collision no energy is lost in the collision and in elastic collision either energy is gained or energy is lost so best example of elastic collision is when we throw a bearing ball on the rigid table for example or a uh, carpet for example or a stone then that ball will bounce back with the energy with which you throw that ball on the rigid table so there no energy is lost and this is the example of elastic collision why the example of inelastic collision is that the ball bearing if it is struck on a drum then that drum has got the elasticity so when drum goes down then energy is absorbed and when it is already above then energy is given to the molecule so there is a gain or loss of energy and this is the example of in and inelastic collision so let me explain you the spectroscopic concept of absorption of a photon by m1 let us suppose that m1 and m2 are two molecular states when molecule in m1 state absorbs a photon h nu it goes in the another molecular state excited state you can say and this molecular state is not stable state after its lifetime this it emits the photon once again and comes to initial state but in this case it emits the same photon which is absorbed by it and this is our well known spectroscopic absorption and emission phenomena and we write the law of conservation of energy delta e is equal to h nu and which is equal to e to minus e1 that we know but raman scattering is bit different than this so for that also we have two molecular states m1 and m2 here photon 1 h nu 1 having energy photon 1 having energy h nu 1 is absorbed by the molecule m1 and it goes in the molecular state m2 but when once again this m2 release this photon we are not sure whether this m2 will again go to m1 or it will occupy another molecular state vibrational state we don't know but the thing is that the energy of this one photon and energy of this second photon is not same so we consider h nu 1 and h nu 2 and corresponding energy g1 and e2 and we rewrite this equation and write the equation h delta nu is equal to delta e so we have now different possibility either e1 is equal to u2 we have rally scattering if e1 or e2 is less than e1 we have stokes line and if e2 is greater than e1 we have anti stokes line so depending on the relation between energy of the emitted photon and incident photon we decategorize the rally scattering stokes scattering or anti stokes scattering 
and immediately as e is, is equal to h nu so if e2 is less than e1 then v2 is less than v1 and lambda 1 is less than lambda 2 stokes line and similarly we can have the relation for anti stokes line but what is mathematical basis for uh, uh, stokes and anti stokes line here is the answer the classical theory of the raman effect it is the theory of molecular polarizability we know when molecule is illuminated by electromagnetic radiation which has got electric field component e bar is the electric field and this electric field component has got the frequency omega which is angular frequency correspondingly the linear frequency is b for example if molecule is illuminated by this photon having energy e and having frequency omega or v linear and this is angular then there is a production of dipole electrical dipole moment it is also called as induced dipole moment why it is called as induced because molecule itself may have the own inherent atomic or displacement polarization polarization means separation of charges and that leads to the electrical force that we know so atom itself or molecule itself have its own inherent atomic or displacement polarizability but in addition to this due to application of this electric field due to illumination of the molecule by radiation induced dipole moment or dipole moment electrical dipole moment is induced in the molecule and that is the reason why they called induced dipole moment. this is direction dependent as e also is a direction dependent therefore alpha is a tensor i am going to explain this you in the next slide or so so when electric field is absorbed by a molecule then the induced dipole moment means positive and negative uh, ions or charges they oscillate with frequency nu which is incident frequency but this incident frequency these oscillations are responsible for vibrational or rotation motion of the molecule inherent rotational and vibration motions of the molecule so when this dipole oscillations they are projected on vibrational and rotational motion of the molecule then polarizability change periodically with respect to time because here e is a function of time and therefore alpha should be function of a vibrational coordinate q is a displacement and as it changes we write d alpha and d alpha would be what partial derivative of alpha with respect to q into total derivative of q and that's what i have written here and it is a function of only one variable therefore partial derivative is written as total derivative d alpha by dq into dq but dq is what change in the vibrational coordinate with respect to vibrational frequency and therefore dq is written there and therefore the alpha induced dipole moment is the sum of or the alpha is the polarizability which is induced polarizability you can say is the sum of equilibrium polarizability that is due to atomic or displacement plus this is due to dipole oscillations beta is d alpha by dq into q0 and sin 2 pi v vibration i have taken there now if i put this alpha there and e there then i have you see alpha is alpha 0 plus beta sin 2 pi v v t and into e is e0 sin 2 pi v t i get this equation and this is what this is the two terms alpha 0 e 0 sin 2 pi v t and nu t and beta e 0 sin sin and we now use the trigonometric relation sin sin is half cos a minus b minus cos a plus b and that leads to v minus nu minus nu vibrational and nu plus v vibrational mm -hmm. somebody will say sir i take nu vibrational first and nu second no problem you can take because cos of minus theta is cos minus cos theta right so it doesn't matter and therefore 
our dipole wire oscillates with three kinds of frequency one is incident frequency other is the stokes line and next is the anti stokes line and this is the answer for the origin of vibrational or stokes and anti stokes line but keep in mind in this equation in this equation if beta is zero what is beta rate of change of polarizability with respect to q if that is zero then we have only rally scattering so for raman active a molecule to be a system to be raman active beta should be non zero and therefore a general rule we can make uh, in order to be a raman active molecular rotation or vibration must cause some change in molecular polarizability of a molecule and this polarizability change in polarizability is reflected in the change in magnitude and direction of the polar polarizability and it is represented by the polarizability ellipsoid i am explaining you what is the idea of ellipsoid in a couple of moment but keep in mind uh, this explanation classical explanation of raman effect is not uh, sufficient to explain the intensity of stokes and anti stokes lines so we need quantum explanation for that so another factors are necessary so as i said this uh, induced dipole moment can be represented by a vector equation mu bar is equal to alpha e bar and this alpha is a tensor it's a matrix n by n matrix and this is written as mu x is equal to this e x this e y this e z and similarly you have all permutations and combinations alpha x x alpha x y alpha x z etc 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 and this is written in the form of matrix multiplication by this so this is electric field is cause and dipole moment induced dipole moment is effect and this effect is through this polarizability tensor now this alpha xx or say alpha yz component of a polarizability tensor what it tells it tells you it talks about the induced dipole induced electrical dipole moment along y axis due to application of a field along z axis so these are nine possible ways so we have different possible combinations of alpha uh, mu and e and that is represented by a tensor equation but keep in mind generally this is tensor is a symmetric tensor the off diagonal element respective off diagonal elements are same that is alpha xy is equal to alpha yx alpha yx is equal to alpha zy alpha xz is equal to alpha zx if it is so for the symmetric tensor then we can transform our coordinate system from x y z to say another coordinate system x dash y dash z dash such that the trace of this tensor is retained it is same in this or in that if it is so and if you try to find out what is the dimensions of this alpha mathematically it is a tensor let us see geometrically what it is so mu by e and mu is what induced dipole moment dipole moment means charge into distance and electric field charge per unit area so if we remove this charge we get distance cube that is l cube that is volt so alpha geometrically is a kind of volume and if alpha x s y y and alpha z z if they are same that volume is a sphere so basically it is a polarizability ellipsoid if alpha x s alpha y y alpha z z they are not same and therefore the polarizability tensor though mathematically it is a tensor physically or geometrically it is the ellipsoid and keep in mind this ellipsoid and the shape of this ellipsoid determines the selection rules of the transitions later on this will be very important so what we can do we can diagonalize this and make this off diagonal elements to be zero and keep only diagonal element then we can switch from this system to that system with the help of this ellipsoid equation this ellipsoid is the three dimensional uh, picture of the ellipse 
we know three dimensional picture of the circle is sphere similarly three dimensional picture of the ellipse is ellipsoid this slides gives you the polarizable pictures of the polarizability ellipsoids for the simple diatomic molecule like hydrogen here i have showed hydrogen what you can see the hydrogen molecule is showed in the electric field direction of electric field is from left to right and the direction of a bond these bonds are formed by the electrons the direction of this bond is perpendicular to the direction of electric field here and here it is parallel it is observed that the polarizability is not same in these two cases so it is more in this case double than this and therefore polarizability is unisotropic it is not same in all direction therefore it is unisotropic and the unisotropic uh, nature of the polarizability can be showed by ellipsoid not by sphere and therefore the polarizability in b is more than across band that is a and it is twice here than there and what this polarizability ellipsoid is it is the three dimensional surface and on this surface polarizability oh, is same and Uh, the distance of the surface is proportional to one upon uh, root a i, where a i is the polarizability along the line joining the ellipsoid and the electrical center. So this is one thing. Another thing is if you if you think of the another triatomic molecule like water, where polarizability is different in different directions. So water is a triatomic molecule, and its polarizability is ellipsoid small ellipse ellipsoid bigger ellipsoid still bigger ellipsoid but its orientation is different so three different axes we have three different orientations of the polarizability ellipsoid if you take example of the chloroform cacl3 for example so in this case polarizability is greater across the symmetry axis and this is the bottom axis you can see this molecule is viewed from the bottom and from bottom you can see the polarizability is a sphere but it is greater across the symmetry axis so hope you have understood the concept of polarizability ellipsoid and it is very important now we go to the theory of uh, the pure rotational raman spectra here the information which you have already learned which i have already explained you in my previous lecture is important the example of a rigid rotator example of a rigid rotator this is the rotational quantum number and these are rotational energy levels and the selection rule is delta j is plus and minus 1 so either we have absorption or emission and we have equidistant lines as in case of a rigid rotator but keep in mind the rotational energy levels of the linear molecules they are given as ej is equal to bj into bracket j plus 1 minus dj square j plus 1 square in the wave number units where j is 0 1 2 3 4 b is rotational constant and it is function of the moment of inertia along b axis and d is a non rigid rotator uh, distortion constant it is called as centrifugal distortion constant and uh, this can be ignored so far as raman spectroscopy is concerned because uh, our instrument they have got less precision value of d is very very small 10 to the power minus 3 and uh, our wave numbers they are of the order of say 1 per cm or 10 per cm that is the reason why we can conveniently ignore that later on we can take it back but at this moment we can ignore and therefore our equation remains like that and you can just go on putting value of j to be 0 1 2 3 4 etc etc then you get the value of e and you can find the difference but the selection rule for raman spectra they are different than the microwave spectra for the rigid rotator which i have already explained because this polarizability origin of a polarizability and the polarizability ellipsoid tells me that in case of hydrogen the polarizability along the axis is double than the perpendicular to the axis 
so it is 2 and therefore plus 1 the selection rule which is there in the rigid rotator case has to be replaced by plus 2. So delta j should be 0 plus and minus 2. These are the selection rule. But keep in mind delta j is equal to 0 means j 0 there and j 0 at other place. Means it is Rayleigh scattering. And we know Raman is an emission. It is not absorption. Therefore delta j can't be negative. Therefore delta j should be plus 2. So delta j is plus 2 only. Keep in mind in case of a Raman spectrum. And that's what is typically shown in this figure where rotational energy levels of a diatomic molecule and corresponding rotational Raman spectrum arise due to transition between them is shown here. And these are uh, schematic diagram. They are These are not to the scale. And the spectrum lines are numbered according to their lower j values. So what we see, this is the S branch. We know in previous lecture, I have explained you the names which are given as O, P, Q, R, S branches depending on delta J. If delta J is 0, Q, minus 2, O, minus 1, P, plus 1, R, plus 2, S. So, only delta J plus 2 means S branch. So, for the inner di diatomic molecule, the only S branch is observed. And delta E, change in energy is what here J plus 1, J plus 2 and here J because delta J is 2 plus 2. And if you put that and if you put this formula there and simplify, we get this. So, J is equal to 0 means 6B, 1 means uh, 10B, 14B, uh, 18B, etc. 18B, 12B, 22. And if you see the successive difference, 10B minus 6B, it is 4B, 12, 4B, 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 and that is that. So, this is the equidistance lines. These are the equidistance lines. And these are Stokes lines and these are anti Stokes lines. And we can easily develop a spectrum. And plus sign is for anti Stokes line. Plus sign means for anti Stokes line. Negative sign. This negative sign is for the Stokes line. And V bar X is the wave number of the exciting radius. So, hope you have understood this. And Amit, uh, is it okay? Somebody can reply so that I can, I, I will. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, I'm going ahead. Okay. Now, another is the symmetric top molecule. The, in the previous lecture, I have not taken uh, this example, symmetric top molecule. We know a molecule can be uh, distinguished based upon the values of moment of inertia along A, B, C axis. And the symmetric top molecules are the molecules where I, B is equal to I, C, which is not equal to I, A. And IA is non-zero and we have uh, prolate and octate type of molecules. So, this is one example of uh, CHCl3. And polarizability ellip ellipsoid for the CHCl3 is shown here. And we have seen this example. So, we have A and B separate. A and B. Why? Because IB is equal to IC. Therefore, A is different and B is different depending on value of IB and IC. Now, this in the... A linear molecule for the diatomic molecule where I A is equal to I B is equal to I C then we need not bother A and B and this, this term will not come only this term and that was the example which we explained in the previous slide. Now here I B and I C, I A and I B are different therefore I A minus B comes and we need to insert new quantum number called as A and this is the energy levels formula for the energy levels and here the selection rules are delta K is equal to 0 and delta J is equal to 0 plus minus 1 and plus minus 2. Here also we cannot take into account minus terms minus delta J, delta J to be minus 1 and minus 2 because it is not absorption, it is emission therefore either 0, 1 or 2. But keep in mind 0 also is a not there. There is no change in angular momentum and it is Raman inactive therefore plus 1 and 2, delta J plus 1 and 2. So, delta J plus 1 means R branch and delta J plus 2 means H branch. Very similar to exercise which I have done in previous slides. You can do here also exercise 2 and you can find delta ER and delta ES. And we see that 
in the r branch delta er the lines are to be the separation is to be to be to be here and in case of s branch the separation is 4b 4b as we have seen in the previous case so s branch lines are relatively spaced apart than the r branch and you can juxtapole it merge those these two spectrum because whatever spectrum physically we will get we will get the combined spectrum so here you can see with the of different color lines you can really imagine how s lines and r lines stokes lines and anti stokes lines for the symmetric top molecules can be identified and molecule can be characterized fine this that was a relatively difficult example this is a very simple example of a linear molecule co it is a hetero diatomic molecule co where the vibrational frequency is 2145 per centimeter and b it is experimentally calculated it is 1.93 and if you put it for the uh, yes or o branches and q branches for q branch means this is the exciting radiation therefore only one line and it is omega 0 here you can see q delta j is 0 delta j minus 2 delta j plus 2 yes branch o branch and here selection rule are different here plus minus 1 is not there you see in the first example only plus 2 in the second example plus 1 plus 2 and in this example plus and minus 2 why it is so this is so because the polarizability returns to the same value twice during the rotation as far as co is concerned so our selection rules are every time revised for the different types of molecules i just i am making uh, i am creating curiosity in your mind so for the wave numbers for s branch and for o branch they can be given because delta j is plus 2 here and here minus 2 and so uh, this uh, can be calculated just go on putting value of j for omega 0 to be 2145 and b to be 1.93 per centimeter and you just go on putting j to be 012345 up to 16 only few lines i have taken and i have calculated this new one i have calculated here new and you can see the positions of the new on this side you see on this side and the positions on this side right hand side you see the difference between these two these two so it is 15 per centimeter everywhere there and there and therefore they are equi spaced out so ex theoretically it is seen that the they are equi spaced out and experimentally this is experimental spectrum raman spectrum of co taken at this illumination this illumination fine this was about the molecules and uh, this was about you can say more explanation about the uh, chemistry related now let us see uh, the physics part of course chemistry and physics cannot be learned in confinement we need to simultaneously uh, see them but as far as our curriculum is concerned uh, you can say that uh, this was a, the chemistry discussion now let us enter in the physics the traditional raman spectroscope were based upon the dispersive type of uh, recording dispersive means monochromatizer though we illuminate a molecular system by monochromatic light then the scattered light it contains a uh, various energies and various wavelengths and in order to record the frequency or energy and intensity of those wavelengths we need to rotate we need to fall that on a single crystal and that single crystal has to be rotated as we see in the uv visible spectrophotometer it continuously changes the angle according to 2d cos theta is equal to n lambda d is fixed for different thetas we get different wavelengths so dispersive type of raman spectrum were there existing and it takes uh, few minutes or few hours to record the raman spectrum another thing was in the one of the disadvantage of this raman spectrum was it was time consuming also the peak intensity the peak position finding and if the peak intensity is very very small and if the signal to noise ratio is very high as compared to the peak intensity then it was very difficult to identify the low intensity peak so alternate came on that where interferometric method fabry perot interferometer method was used where 
the Fourier transform technique, which I have explained in my previous lecture, was employed in the Yapti Raman time of the spectrometer. And we know it is the coupling of Raman spectroscopy and FTR. If you have learned, you know FTR technique, and if you know Raman technique, the combination of FTR and Raman is a FT Raman, where we use a monochromatic radiation having wavelength 1064 nanometer. And a spectrum is collected within a, within a second. And it contains, as I am going to show in the next slide, a laser is allowed to fall on a sample and strokes and anti-strokes lines are allowed to fall on multiplexer, detector and detector has got such kind of interferometer which contains all absorbed or emitted frequencies and their um, intensities and that is Fourier transformed by a computer program and we get a Raman spectrum and this is the schematic of a non-destructive FT Raman spectrometer and this is the diagram for the disparity type of so we allow to fall on a grating and the angle of the grating is changed and CCD detector allows you uh, to record the spectrum. But this is advantages. So we have in our PIFC this Brooker type of multi-RAM FT Raman spectrometer. This is a very beautiful instrument and this was a unique type of spectrometer in our country. Only few laboratory uh, has got this uh, spectrometer. Unfortunately, it is under repair. Therefore, right now it is not in working condition and you two are away from this instrument for a long time. Therefore, otherwise I would have showed you uh, the demonstration of this instrument. And next is the micro Raman. It's a very sophisticated technique. Its cost is more than 1 crore. Recently, um, when I was uh, head of the department of uh, common facility center and in charge of uh, um, the coordinator of site center, in that period this instrument has arrived. Micro Raman spectrophotometer. What is the difference between FT Raman and Micro Raman? Micro Raman is basically FT Raman spectrometer. But with the help of Micro Raman spectroscopy, we can focus a light beam through the microscope of the objective 50 times or 100 times so that it is possible to focus the micro region of the sample. Therefore, we can characterize the grains. We can take Raman spectra of that grain or the different, different parts and you can map your sample. And it, and it is a very fast technique and very sophisticated and not only that, in addition to this uh, light in the IR spectrum, because this leads to sample hitting, this micro Raman has got different frequency in visible. This is another advantage. And with the help of this micro Raman technique, we can analyze the surface of the order of 3 to 6 micrometer in time. So, this technique is in working condition in our common facility center. Though our unit is not working, you can analyze your samples with the help of this. Renishaw, Renishaw uh, micro Raman technique. What is the wavelength or what is the criteria for choosing wavelength for the Raman spectrometer? When dispersive type of uh, spectrometer, Raman spectrometer were, were used, the frequently used or the commonly used uh, sources were the uh, gas lasers, argon, krypton, helium, neon, gas lasers having different wavelengths. These wavelengths, uh, they are in visible, uh, few are in UV, in IR, everywhere. These are the laser frequencies which are available, right? So, here I have showed argon, krypton, argon, krypton, uh, double NDVI, NDVI, here, here diode, semiconductor laser, and this is crystal laser, NDVI. And for FT Raman, NDVI is used. What I have showed here with the help of different color, as we increase the wavelength, we decrease the energy, the penetration depth increases. So, it depends on thickness of your sample. If you are working on thin film or bulk material, you can choose a wavelength. So, though you are using micro Raman technique for your analysis, you have the liberty of choosing the wavelength. This point can be more clearly elaborated. Okay, I will just... 
elaborate this and I will show you different colors with having different wavelength and penetration depth you can see up to 10 micron you can go when you use the 800 nanometer laser. So here I have tried to show how the higher excitation wavelength leads to deeper penetration and this I have taken from one of the presentations from the JNCS CSR bundle. Spatial resolution and the penetration depth. Here on the silicon substrate three layers are grown. Gradient SIG layer alloy of silicon and germanium semiconducting layer. Uniform layer of SIG and here strain the layer of silicon. These are a few nanometer thickness and these are few micron. So, if I illuminate this thin film with red laser, then I will get peak due to silicon substrate, this one, and due to this SIG E layer or that or that. But if I illuminate it with blue laser, then I will not get the peak due to substrate. I will get peak due to SIGE, SIGE. And if I illuminate it with violet laser, 325 nanometer, I will get the peak only due to top silicon layer. So it is in your hand that which layer, uh, which laser you have to take. But if it is FT Raman, then you don't have choice because it is NDI. But it is micro Raman. If it is micro Raman, then you have choice. Many times students get jumbled because the micro Raman graph on the y axis, though it is intensity, on the x axis, they find various units like wavelength in nanometer, frequency in hertz, absolute wave number in per centimeter. They also find Raman shift in per centimeter. They also find Raman shift in nanometer. So we get jumbled. Uh, what is there on the x axis and what is being changed? This we should not jump. Up. I have given you one example where the system of crocoite, that is monoclinic PBCRO4 system crystal, was illuminated by argon plus 5141 nanometer laser and Somebody will say, where is the peak of this laser? Argon. Incident. The filter is used such that only that is removed because intensity of Raman is 1 as to 10 or 1 as to 100. If 100 is intensity of the incoming illuminating radiation, 1 is the intensity of Raman. Even less than that. So, we need to filter that. We need to filter that. So, in spectrum, Raman spectrum, we don't see or we usually filter out the incoming in illumination, right? And this is zero and on this side, we have Stokes line and on this side, we have anti-Stokes line. But we know Raman shift is the difference between the incident light and the scattered light. Incident means EX. And this is scattered light. And if we write this frequency in wave number, this nu is equal to c by lambda. So c, c, c goes. So 1 upon lambda, 1 upon lambda we get for Raman, for excitation, for the scattered light. But we know the wavelength of the incoming radiation that is lesser is generally in nanometer. I have shown in my previous slide. We can choose the uh, illuminating radiation from the visible or IR, so that is in nanometer. If it is in nanometer, and if we want Raman shift in per centimeter, then 10 to the power of 7 comes, because nanometer and centimeter, hmm, 10 to the power of 7 uh, relation is there, we know, and therefore this comes. So if we have excitation wavelength in nanometer, electromagnetic spectrum wavelength in nanometer, then you can convert your spectrum in Raman shift in per centimeter, that's what is shown here. Or if you already record it in Raman shift, for example, then you can convert it in the wavelength or frequency or wave number with the help of this step. So you see, for example, Raman shift is minus 600 per centimeter. Here, correspondingly, we have wave number 20,000. This one, we have correspondingly frequency 6 into 10 to the power of 14 hertz. Correspondingly, we have wavelength to be 499. 
so you need not frighten of the x axis in the raman spectroscopy henceforth what is there in the raman spectra so we have incoming radiation for example we have stokes lines we have anti stokes lines you will see and very important observation you can make is that we have symmetric lines 261 261 364 364 667 667 intensity of the stokes line is greater than the intensity of the anti stokes line a simple reason for this is for obtaining anti stokes line where e2 is greater than e1 our molecule has to be go in the excited state and molecule should absorb some ir so unless your molecule has absorbed the ir radiation anti stokes lines will not get so probability of occurring anti stokes line is very very less if your system is not excited right and therefore if we filter out it is illuminating laser and intensity of anti stokes line is already low so what you get in raman spectra is the stokes lines somebody will say sir we get only three lines do we get only one line no it depends on probability of virtual excited states how many virtual excited states are there those those many peaks will be there and here lies the principle of quantum mechanics you know we don't know whether our system is in the ground state or excited state and we don't know whether system is simultaneously in ground state or excited state but and when we do experiment then only we come to know my system has these possible virtual states so raman spectrum contains the stokes line keep in mind because the illuminating laser they are filtered out intensity of anti stokes line and this is the spectrum of chloroform i have taken from the standard database how many lines are possible just now i i told you how many lines are possible for example this is these are stokes lines and the, dip, uh, the intensity of different stokes line is different well answer we can find out because i have i can talk about the intensity of raman lines in separate lecture there is a resonance raman raman there laser raman spectroscopy scrs is there so many are there but in general if we have a molecule it may be a linear molecule only one or two uh, two uh, atoms or three atoms which are linearly spaced or we have polyatomic molecules like this there are 15 atoms in the tulip how many possible combinations are there so how many degrees of freedom of vibration for example are there then they are given by simple classical rule 3n minus 6 classical vibrations are degrees of freedom are so 15 3s are 45 minus 6 39 vibration should be there these are maximum possible classical vibration number of vibrations but our system follows the quantum rule out of these 39 only few are allowed according to quantum rules which are they these are say 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 some 17 to 18 lines are observed of course there are few lines whose intensity is less but maximum possible lines which we can have they are 3n minus 6 keep in mind n is the number of atoms we can do as i told qualitative and as well as quantitative analysis uh, from the raman spectroscopy if you take one has to one mixture of tulin and acetonitrile for example 50 has to 50 then we get peak of acetonitrile as well as tulin so these blue indexed peak are of tulin and red index peak are acetonitrile from the peak position you can do the qualitative analysis and by finding the area under curve you can find the composition so you can do qualitative and quantitative analysis as well uh, as far as raman spectroscopy is concerned it is a very significant study of two alcohols two alcohols methanol muh and ethanol only one difference of ch group ch3 is it not methanol ch3 oh and ethanol ch3 ch2 oh so ch2 is more here but you can see though 
few common deformations vibrations oh stretching vibration appears ch stretching vibration appears ch3 deformation appears but in methanol we get co stretching which is absent there or intensity is less and cco stretching which is present here in ethanol which is absent there this one more uh, deformation is there which is missing here so you see raman spectroscopy is so sensitive and so crucial technique for distinguishing the two alcohols for example very near alcohols fine now let us see uh, some theory about the number of vibrations or the designations or what you can say the titles given to the peaks for example if it is carbonaceous material then the peak names are given as d2 g band somewhere a1 g eu eg band stretching vibration bending vibration lo to many names we see is it not because we we are not concerned with the research in chemistry but we are concerned with the research in metal science for example if you take raman spectrum what we see we see peaks labeled as a1g for example in to tio2 au eg etc right so so let us see what this letter stands for and how to find out theoretically these vibrations and how to make the collaborative uh, um, conversion interrelation so these vibration types of species are designated according to symmetry operations and we know there is a separate paper symmetry point group phase group etc right so letter a is used for the symmetric around with respect to principal axis for example this a1 is written so this is one molecule for example it is o and here h and h and this is axis of rotation and this is called as principal axis of rotation generally it is along z axis and o here here n and their frequencies are different their frequencies are different so they are denoted by a1 why a is a symmetric to the principal axis of symmetry and one is a subscript one stands for symmetric with respect to rotational axis and therefore a1 means symmetric with respect to principal axis and symmetric with respect to rotational axis that is meaning of a1 and of course b1 anti symmetric with respect to principal axis and one means symmetric with respect to the rotational axis so depending on whether it is symmetric or anti symmetric with respect to principal axis with respect to rotational axis the letters are given b is anti symmetric e is doubly degenerate t or f is triply degenerate g and u symmetric with respect to center of symmetry u anti symmetric with respect to center of symmetry and so primes are there double primes are there symmetric and anti symmetric with respect to plane of symmetry g and u are german words for grade upgrade meaning even or uneven so these are all these are the terms from the symmetry operations so a b e you can go through any standard book and you can you can know what the meaning of a1 is e z for example so e means double degenerate and g stands for the meaning is e1 grade e1 right point group this is applied on both molecule and crystals and this is a very deep study and uh, many crystallographers and they uh, they know too much about this so crystal can be classified can be grouped as per their symmetry molecule also can be classified and group as per their symmetry and what what this symmetry is so either we rotate or translate our atoms in the crystal or molecule and we see that my molecule or crystal is unchanged and that is defined by symmetry that is the symmetry and the point groups contains all object having same symmetry elements 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल रोटेशन बाय 360 सिक्सटी इज डिनोटेड बाय सी वन बिकॉज इट इज सी टू पाई बाय एन एन इज टू पाई फॉर एग्जाम्पल देन टू पाई टू पाई कम्स वन सो सी वन इज रोटेशन थ्रू 360. सिक्सटी इफ आई रोटेट माय मॉलिक्यूल थ्रू थ्री सिक्सटी एंड स्टिल माय मॉलिक्यूल लुक सेम मॉलिक्यूल इज नॉट चेंज एपरेंट शेप एंड एपरेंट पिक्चर ऑफ द मॉलिक्यूल इज एज इट इज देन इट इज कॉल्ड एज ए सी वन रोटेशन और C1 सिमेट्री इलेमेंट सो वन पर्टिकुलर मॉलिक्यूल और वन पर्टिकुलर क्रिस्टल मे हैव लार्ज नंबर ऑफ सिमेट्री ऑपरेशन सो वॉट काइंड ऑफ ऑपरेशन आर दे वन इज आइडेंटिटी ऑपरेशन आइडेंटिटी ऑपरेशन इट इज रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय दिस एंड इट इज लेटर ई रोटेशन जस्ट नाउ आई शेड टू पाई बाय एन सो वी हैव सी वन सी टू सी थ्री अप टू सी नाइन ऑपरेशन एंड इट इज एन फोर्ड रोटेशन we have reflection also reflection also so this reflection is denoted by sigma and reflection can be seen in the mirror we know so we sigma is mirror plane mirror plane sigma h mirror plane sigma v mirror plane sigma d inversion so molecule is inverted so if it is then it is this inversion letter i rotation followed by reflection perpendicular to axis of rotation it is sn so we have s1 s2 s3 etc etc it is called as improper rotation so we keep in mind e cn sigma i and sn as the symbols for the symmetry operations and one particular molecule or one particular crystal have large number of symmetry operations keep in mind and for molecules i have shown on this slide If you are, if you are, if you want to see it magnified version, then you can see this identity rotation, inversion, improper rotation, and various mirror planes. And if you want to see these, you can see this C1, C2, 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 C3. I have shown here C2, etc. correspondingly as i told c1 c2 etc etc so c n group they are group common point so c2 c3 c4 c5 c6 c7 c8 are called as cn linear group for example this one c h c n c infinity v d infinity h sn s2 s4 s6 s z s10 s12 etc etc so these are common point groups for the molecules i will not go in the details of uh, discussions of this common group because this is not my motto to teach you crystallography is it not but just i want to create a curiosity in your mind so that you will be very near to water for example you are thirsty and i am taking you to near water and you have to drink water right can i uh, name various possible uh, symmetry groups for my molecule or for my crystal yes how let us begin you can write the algorithm for that you begin if you have more axis of rotation if you have two axis of rotation you follow this route and if you have more than one axis of rotation here only one axis of rotation you go this side if you have more than two axis you follow this and you can name the groups th td oh th etc so you can see the details in any standard book there is a important thing in in the crystallography called as character table this character table is a two dimensional character table you can see which has got rows and which has got columns so rows contains irreducible representation or character because this minus 1 means b1 minus 1 sigma dash cv means b1 is inversion and b2 is same as that of this one like that you can so these characters are either plus 1 or minus 1 and one particular row is the representation of the b2 this row is the representation of b1 this row is the representation of a2 etc and these are the symmetry operation just now i told identity c2 rep mirror reflection along yz xz etc and this represents the 
point group level c2 and what column represents these are the symmetry representation levels a1 a2 b1 b2 etc so each point group has complete set of possible symmetry operations and when i say c2 we means hidden agenda is this one and depending on there is two more columns here that tells you whether your molecule is ir active or raman active this will come soon so let us take the example of tio2 we know tio2 has got three forms anatize rutile and one more is there so take example of anatize anatize tio2 has got a space group to be p42 m and n m and m that is another notation for that is d4h space group and this tio2 of course uh, list of other crystals also is given jr jro2 tio2 rutile chso2 etc other minerals are given and in this table we know there are more than 230 uh, there are 230 space group and the names are given like that like that and that is another topic so here when we switch from molecular system to solid state system that is crystalline system for example then we need to talk in terms of unit cell factor group symmetry element instead of molecule molecular symmetry but of course you can have the correlation between molecular symmetry and crystal symmetry and exactly that is being done with the help of character table site symmetry etc so take example of tio2 where there are four formula units per unit cell in one unit cell there are four tio2 means four ti and a to o2 like that but there are only two lattice points in one formula unit in unit cell the the atoms are sitting at the lattice points they are two you can see the crystal structure of uh, anatize uh, tio2 while in case of rutile there is only one so if i divide this 4 by 2 the answer will come to and that is the formula unit let me enlarge that that will give you the formula units per bravais cell and that is two so what does this mean this mean that in one bravais cell of anatize tio2 there are two molecules of tio that is two ti atoms and four o atoms that's what is shown here and that is given by the symmet side symmetry for ti to anise space group this one side symmetry is the geometrical relationship between faces and edges in solid state physics we study the electronic band structure and there we think uh, study of bravais like ws cell and space group the phase position gamma position o position delta position lambda position so you need to study in deep as far as this crystallography is concerned and side symmetry is concerned so ti is possible that for tio2 if you refer the uh, wyckoff sites of the ti atom there are two ti atom 000 is the one lattice point origin and 0 half half is the another position and this one is the another wake up position e where there are four atoms 1 2 3 4 four o atoms right and two ti atoms so six atoms four o atoms corresponding to this side symmetry and two ti atoms corresponding to this side symmetry so d to d we refer to character table d to d now and we need to uh, uh, refer to c to v character table and these character table they are available in any standard book and uh, you can find out the character table so for, for character table as i told what is given it is given that whether your molecule or the crystal which has got these side symmetry then whether they are ir active or raman active so th that is there so d2d for tio2 b2 
has xy translational symmetry e xz yz translation symmetry and they are raman active otherwise x square plus y square is not translational it is a spherical is it not it is a it's a equation for circle so it is not translation of molecule is it not similarly z square and these are x y and z these are not in plane so planar translation are raman active or axial translation they are ir active so you get b2 and e and same data for this tio2 a ti in tio2 leads to 2 ti atom gives tz and 4 o atoms gives tx and ty translational symmetry keep in mind translation why because we are considering the vibrations in in crystal molecules will not rotate they will vibrate they will vibrate means they will have the translational symmetry and out of all possible uh, symmetry elements these are symmetry elements only these are responsible for raman activity and therefore i consider only b2 and e so b2 and e what is ea symmetric along principal axis symmetric along rotational axis a1 similarly symmetric anti symmetric anti symmetric symmetric anti symmetric anti symmetric double is in there so b2 and e as i told on the previous slide where i translate from correlate d2 d side group to d4h factor group factor group is for crystal side group is for molecule so for crystal which symmetry operations are there which modes of vibration or oscillations are there for b2 a1g aug these are from tables for e eg and eu so what you can think you we we can think that in tio2 molecule these are the modes of vibrations of the ti atom if ti is single if only ti is there four vibrational modes are there but we know here ti is not alone o also is there so we need to think of correlation table like this for o as well and where we need to see another side group and that is d2v c2v okay so another uh, thing which i would like to explain you is that in this correlation between side group species and factor group species we think of total degree of freedom is it not so for two ti atom along three direction 60 degrees of freedom of vibration okay according to side species say gamma spider species are there the number of translation in this species are t raised to gamma and which is 1 for t2 and 2 for tx and t1 and degree of vibrational freedom for given side species is f raised to gamma which is equal to t raised to gamma into f and which is 2 and 4 and if i add this take summation of f y that comes out to be 6 similarly if factor group species are zeta then the contribution of freedom uh, degrees of freedom by each side species in crystal to the factor species zeta is a1 so for b2 1 1 because b2 0 0 because here b2 is not there but here e is absent therefore 0 0 but here e is there 1 1 so if i add these two 1 1 1 1 1 so 1 everywhere and this c is the degeneracy degeneracy of the factor group species and that also is given in table and if we multiply this c into 1 1 1 2 2 2 so 2 to the 4 and this to 6 so 6 so 6 degrees of freedom are allowed for ti but out of this 6 out of this 6 only 4 are there which one b1g a2 e e g and e u b1 g a2 u e g and u these are modes of vibrations of the ti okay along ti similar exercise we can do for o where there are four o atoms 
So 12 degrees of freedom, 4 threes are 12. Similarly, these 4 threes are 12. Total vibrational degrees of freedom. And this addition of this, very similar to this one which we did in the previous. I will not repeat. You can go one by because otherwise it will take too much time. Already one and a half hour is there. So 1 plus 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 2, means 12. So these 12 modes are there. Out of these 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Quantization. 8 vibrations are there for only oxygen. Now if when we form a molecule TiO2, then these 4 and these 8 combined together will give you total vibrations for the TiO2. Anatized TiO2. But out of these vibrations, modes, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 9, 12. So 12 vibrational modes are there. But A, U and E, U, they are acoustical modes, therefore A are active, they are I are active. And B to U is inactive. Only Raman active modes are there. A1G to B1G and EZ. And that is the reason why anatized TiO2 contains five Raman bands, A1G, B1G, 2 of course, and 3 EZ. And that is I have given on this. So this one, A1G, 2 modes, B1, 1 mode, B2G, 1 mode, EZ, 2 mode. So 2 EZ, 1, 2, B2G, 1, B1G, 1, and 2 A1G, Right? Oh, I'm sorry. Here, misplace has that. To B1G, I have shown here. To B1G, this one B1G, this one B1G. Anyway, there are six. There is one correction in this character table. But what effectively we can see in case of an anatized TiO2, you can find six vibrational modes as far as crystal is concerned. And that's what this is the Raman spectra. And these are Stokes lines. Keep in mind, these are not anti-Stokes lines. There is no excitation level. Okay. You can choose the any excitation uh, laser for this in visible. Or this uh, NDIAG also you can choose. And you can find. Similar exercise you can do for the rutile. And you can see there are four modes. One, two, three, four. Only one is repeating. EG and A1G is repeating. EG and A1G. And these are different. So this rutile and anatyles, they have got different crystal structure, their band gaps are different, their Raman spectrum also is different. And we have seen in the exercise which I have given earlier, how crucial and very important is to analyze, to theoretically find out the modes and their positions. You can find out positions also, you can find out intensities also. We can do the crystalline structure analysis also. For example, for crystalline ZrCiO2, SI4, this is the pattern. And for amorphous also we get peaks. For amorphous and crystalline, we get different patterns for boron carbide. For crystalline cords, you get peak. For amorphous fused cords, you get different pattern. So you, you can, and of course you can find out the percentage of amorphous and crystalline as I told. But keep in mind, in case of amorphous material, we don't get peaks in the XR. But we get peaks in the Raman. Carbon althrops and polymorphs, we know. We get different Raman patterns. And G band is there, 2D band is there. For carbon nanotube, graphene, nanofiber, graphite, carbon black and graphene oxide. HOPG, the patterns we can do and if you see the different uh, Raman pattern and you, you can do a lot of study from Raman spectrum. And this is the list of the Raman spectra which are studied in the department of physics by various researchers. I have taken this from literature, zinc oxide, tungsten trioxide, zirconium oxide, cobalt ferrite, CZTS, TiO2. These are all thin films. Zinc oxide, iron oxide, then gallium doped, tungsten trioxide, nickel hydroxide, 
bismuth, molybdenate, and barium, strontium, ferrite. This is actin hexafluoride, graphene oxide, pani, PPY, zinc oxide, and tungsten trioxide prepared with hydrothermal method. CNTs, functionalized CNTs. And we can see uh, there are five easy modes. One, two, three, four, five easy modes in case of alpha carbon oxide. And two A1G modes, this one and that two. So this was my paper, which was published in 2015. Fine. Only a couple of minutes I will take and then I will wind up my discussion. The intensity of a Raman is you know, 1 to the 100, for example, or 1 to the 1000, for example, as far as uh, hundreds, of course, as far as illumination intensity is concerned. And intensity of a Raman is pro directly proportional to frequency of incident radiation. It is directly proportional to the intensity of incident radiation. It is directly proportional to the Boltzmann factor, e to the power of minus EI by KT, and it is directly proportional to the concentration. But it is directly proportional to the Raman cross section also. And we see that Raman cross section is 10 to the power of minus 31 to 10 to the power of minus 36 centimeter square, and that limits the sensitivity of the Raman technique. And in addition to this, we get the fluorescence, whose intensity is more, and therefore Raman intensities are buried in the fluorescence. And that is the reason why we need to use the NDAG, and the NDAG leads to hitting the sample, burning of the sample, for example, in case of a uh, carbon materials or in case of uh, polymers, we cannot use uh, NDA, is it not? And therefore, the alternative strategy is suggested for enhancing the Raman uh, activity. We know in case of metals, we cannot see Raman and due to its lower sensitivity and fluorescence also is there. So what can be done? We can deposit our material in thin film form on a metal, for example, gold or palladium, whose SPR phenomena, surface plasma resonance phenomena takes place. So we know every metal has got its plasma frequency. Solid state physics knows this. Every, every metal has got its own plasma frequency. And if we eliminate that metal with the help of frequency greater than plasma frequency, then that metal is transparent to that radiation. And that is the significance of plasma frequency. And this plasma frequency, if we eliminate that metal with the help of plasma frequency, radiation having that frequency equal to plasma frequency, then resonance occurs and that absorbs and that energy is being transferred to enhance the Raman activity. And therefore, if we deposit our material whose Raman we have to study on a metal, some sub substrate which, which is metallic for example, then there is an enhancement in the Raman type. You see here Raman peaks are there, but here enhancement in the Raman spectroscopy. So surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is the another technique in addition to laser Raman spectroscopy, resonance spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy. And that's all. That ends my discussion, uh, marathon discussion, which lasted more than uh, 90 minutes or so.